And so over the next year or two, I think we are going to start to see systems that are a lot better at doing kind of longer term things. Like the longer term actions, they kind of need to be right. If you're right 80% of the time and you do 10 things in a row, you're actually fairly likely to fail, right? And so if you, you kind of have to get that up to like 90, 99, you know, 99.9, .9, if you really want to be taking much longer sequences of actions. But I do think that we're going to start to see you know, a lot of that performance happening over the next year or two. And that's going to be a pretty interesting, weird world where these things are actually working like kind of like we would expect as people. We're not using reinforcement learning to learn this, right? Like that's not how you get a PhD. You don't try getting a PhD 10,000 times and then you finally get it and you say, oh, I guess I should do more of that to get my PhD. Like that's not at all how we do almost everything, right? We're mostly planning. We're mostly thinking and anticipating and like using this kind of logical reasoning stuff. And so that's why we've kind of shifted our focus towards those types of tasks, towards the like coding tasks, reasoning tasks, tasks in your browser, desktop, where the planning piece is there. There's a lot of complexity in the real world, right? Like, you know, you think about like Stripe or something. It's like, how can there be so many people working in Stripe? Like all you're doing is paying for a thing online. How hard can that be? Turns out really hard. Turns out there's a lot of details to that kind of stuff, right? It turns out everything is like that. And so if we have a system that can more automatically break these things down and like actually start solving these problems and putting them back together properly again, I think it's going to look, you know, broad strokes kind of similar, but in a sense, it'll be quite different because this can happen dynamically. This can change over time. You might be able to come back to the system and say, you know, we're using this language model here, but it's doing something stupid. Like we're just doing addition. Let's just call Wolf from Alpha. Or let's just use a calculator. Okay, great. Now it's a lot faster. And so once this is kind of more dynamic, it's going to be more evolving. It's going to be able to like optimize and like, you know, continually improve in a way that's much, much harder for like a self-driving car system that's been made by, you know, whole huge teams of people. Hello, and welcome to The Cognitive Revolution, where we interview visionary researchers, entrepreneurs, and builders working on the frontier of artificial intelligence. Each week, we'll explore their revolutionary ideas, and together, we'll build a picture of how AI technology will transform work, life, and society in the coming years. I'm Nathan LeBenz, joined by my co-host, Eric Torenberg. Hello, and welcome back to The Cognitive Revolution. Today, my guest is Josh Albrecht, founder and CTO of Imbue, a research company dedicated to building practical AI agents that can accomplish larger goals and safely work for us in the real world, which despite being pre-product, recently raised $200 million from investors, including NVIDIA, a significant part of which will go toward a cluster of 10,000 H100 GPUs. Imbue is a fascinating company that I honestly struggled to make sense of at first. I did my usual prep. I read through their research papers and their public writing. And I also listened to a couple of recent interviews. But still, I came away without a coherent sense of the company as a whole. In this conversation, we cover the company's diverse outputs, which range from virtual world simulators for reinforcement learning to a cost-aware hyperparameter optimizer to theoretical research papers. And there are a lot of great nuggets in here, including a few moments where Josh challenges some of my assumptions. But it was only on listening back to this conversation and really trying to zoom out from the details that I feel like I began to understand the Imbue thesis from an investor perspective. And to be clear, this may not be quite how Imbue sees themselves, but after taking it all in and chewing on it for a while, I understand Imbue as one of a small but growing class of company, which could prove extremely important depending on how a few key questions in AI end up being answered. One possible path for AI development, and arguably still the most likely, is that raw compute scale will be required to push the state of the art forward, and that today's leading model developers, OpenAI, DeepMind, Anthropic, and Meta, will continue to lead the market. But another possibility is that scale won't be all we need, that gains from ever more pre-training become uneconomical, and that the way to make agents robust, reliable, and restrained enough to be trusted with meaningful work will be unlocked by a combination of painstaking fine-tuning and carefully engineered complementary systems, including better retrieval, supervision, and novel user interfaces. It's in this latter scenario that Imbue seems to me most likely to pay off for investors in a major way, because it might take a series of eureka moments to make things work, and such progress does often come from small but highly aligned teams like Imbue's, led by dynamic, visionary founders like Josh and his partner Kanjun, who create highly intentional and opinionated culture, follow their own unique research intuitions wherever it may take them, and intensively dog food their own products, even in the early days when they don't really yet work. In the end, I came away from this conversation not only super impressed with Josh, 
but convinced that Imbue has all the right ingredients to achieve something truly unique and special. And so they will definitely be a company that I'll continue to watch. As always, if you're enjoying the show, we appreciate your reviews on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and we love to see folks sharing the show with their friends online. Now, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Josh Albrecht of Imbue. Let's get into it. Josh Albrecht, founder and CTO of Imbue, welcome to the Cognitive Revolution. Thanks so much. So super excited to talk to you. Your company, uh, some may know it in the, by its former name of Generally Intelligent, now Imbue, fresh off a major $200 million fundraise, is focused on developing AI agents that are capable of reasoning and can help us accomplish larger tasks in the world. So that's no small um, undertaking. For starters, love to just kind of hear you know a little bit about Imbue as you've been developing it and as it exists today. Um, and then I want to get into like, how do we make this reasoning stuff work? Yeah, I mean, we started Imbue uh, a few years ago now, basically seeing all of the self-supervised learning stuff actually working and realizing, you know, we've been working with traditional machine learning for a long time ago. I did my uh, master's in, in research way back before deep learning was even a thing back when, you know, support vector machines were the cool thing. I've always kind of been watching the field thinking like, oh, okay, it's like now the time to get back into more of the research side and, you know, work on the kind of larger, more interesting problems at AI. Uh, and eventually I think in like 2019, it got to the point where it's like, okay, I can really see, I can see how we can move away from these supervised systems that require just huge teams of human laborers. It's really just people putting the right answer in there and moving to systems that are really able to learn very interesting patterns completely on their own. Uh, and I can see, you know, this happening for vision and audio and text and all these different modalities. And I can really see how we can start to put these things together to make much bigger, much more capable systems. And so that's kind of when we decided to take a step back from what we were currently doing, figure out how to like, okay, how do we make a research company that can actually tackle these much larger problems? That term research company, very interesting unto itself. What does it mean to be a research company to you guys? And, you know, notably, as far as I can tell, you have published research, but no products yet, right? So how are you kind of thinking of your evolution from research to, you know, presumably a product offering company at some point? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's why I'm, we're, we've been pretty intentional since the very beginning about calling it a research company. So not a research lab. We don't only do research. We're not a purely academic, not a purely not profit, not only about science. And we're not only a company. We're not just a startup. We're not just trying to make a product. It is kind of a mix of the two things. And part of the reason for that is that the stuff that you know we're trying to do, we're trying to make these agents that can actually reason and think and you know be intelligent, like make computers that can really do what we want them to do. That is an open research problem. So there is a lot of stuff to figure out. But as we've gone further and further, we've gotten closer and closer to being able to make things that are just actually really useful today. Like we can make products today, you know, us and other startups and other people building on top of existing APIs, et cetera. We are starting to see a lot of stuff that's really useful. And for us, you know, with this with this latest raise, we are actually developing things that will become our actual product. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully not too distant future, probably sometime next year, we'll have more to say about that. And we are working on that. But it is still a research company because there is still a connection between the kind of questions that we need to ask and the product that we're trying to build. There's a lot of open questions about how do you want to interact with these kind of AI agent systems? If you have something that goes off and, you know, takes actions on your behalf for days, doing this really complicated thing, spending, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars on your behalf, you really want to know what it's doing. And you don't want to see it in like a big text log. You don't want to have like just a chat interface with this thing, right? There, there might be other types of modalities, other ways you want to interact. So there's like UI questions. There's also tons and tons of questions on like, how do you make it not annoying to interact with? You don't want to have to get all these instructions to do this thing. Like, how do you get it to kind of generalize, but in a way that's kind of, you know, making sure it doesn't drift too far away from you want it, what you want it. So there's tons and tons of open questions. And really for us, we're thinking about the product. And like right now, we're really focused on building tools for ourselves uh, so that we can ex kind of experience the pain of using these things and kind of make them better and better and make sure this stuff is actually working until we get to a place where it like feels really good as a user of these kind of APIs and language models. Right now, using these to build bigger systems is sort of an exercise in frustration, right? You're like trying to make new prompts. You're trying to like put these things together. They don't quite work. They kind of go off the rails. They sometimes work. You change it. It seems like it works better, but it's expensive to run the evaluation. It's just kind of annoying to interact with. So we want to make tools that make it much easier, much more pleasant for not just developers, but eventually, you know, other less technical users to kind of build their own things with AI as well. Maybe you could kind of help me survey the sort of reasoning landscape a little bit better. I mean, 
seems like today, at least of everything I've tried, GPT-4 is you know pretty clearly like the best reasoning language model that's out there. Um, maybe you could kind of speculate on like how they've you know managed to get as far as they have. Um, you know what techniques you guys are finding to be most uh, successful and promising, and and like how good is this reasoning going to get over the next uh, you know say year? Which you know beyond that, my crystal ball is, is like totally dark anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good question. Certainly don't know everything that OpenAI is doing. I think one thing that we do know is that uh, they are definitely using a lot of human data. <laughs> so in machine learning, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, we see these language models, they look so awesome, they look so impressive. Oh, maybe this totally new thing is happening. It's still garbage in, garbage out. The data quality still matters a huge amount. Um, and so there's a bunch of things you can do on the data quality. I'm sure they have a bunch of teams that are, you know, fixing up the common crawl and the like public web stuff that they have, probably some like books and other higher quality data and code and all this other stuff, right? And so I'm sure they're doing a good job at that. But they also have, I'm pretty sure, a very large team of human labelers that work on kind of making back and forth dialogues specifically for some of these use cases like code. And so I'm pretty sure they have a very large team of people where it's like a person on one end asking something about code, a person on the other end ask, answering it. And like writing out a nice thing and they and they're generating, I think, a lot, a lot of data like this. And so that kind of data, I think, makes it look like these systems are performing really well because you're asking a question that's like kind of in distribution. It's kind of seeing someone ask, how do I invert a matrix using NumPy or whatever, right? That I think is probably getting them pretty far. Uh, they also, if you'll you'll notice like when you ask in GPT-4, it kind of starts out when you ask a question with a sort of like let's think step by step or kind of like rolling things out. And these kind of techniques are kind of baked into the training data a little bit now for them as well to help it guide guide the system to like a better answer. Part of that just happens naturally as a side effect of RLHF. Part of that is probably intentional on their side, kind of choosing how to kind of launch it in this directory that makes it into this trajectory that makes it a little more likely to be right. I'm sure they have a bunch of other small hacks and tricks like that as well. You know, maybe deciding like, which piece of the model? I think there were some questions before about like this is, you know, different experts maybe you route to a particular expert for certain queries. Like there's probably other things that go into it, but I think probably the biggest ones are the data quality uh, and using these techniques to kind of help make the language model make a more reasonable response. So those are those are really good and they're great places to start. I think in the academic literature, you know, people have found even other things that are interesting besides just chain of thought. You can also have graph of thought or tree of thought or these other types of techniques. You know, you can sample, you can uh, do kind of consistency approaches where you do a whole bunch of things and you check like, okay, how frequently does it get the same answer? Maybe that's more likely to be right. So there's lots and lots of ideas that people have had. And I think those are the kinds of things that we're pretty interested to explore as well as other ones about how can you kind of spend more compute at inference time? How can you do a lot more work to get to a slightly better answer? So for us thinking about agents, we're usually thinking about things that operate on a longer time scale as a chat application, you really don't, as a user, want to be sitting there waiting for it to get, you know, a 10, 20% better answer by taking a really long time. But if, if the system is working for you overnight, you don't care how long it takes, right? And so those kind of techniques, I think, can allow us to push the frontier of these kind of reasoning systems to end up getting things that are like much more likely to be accurate and much more calibrated. And so over the next year or two, I think we are going to start to see systems that are a lot better at doing kind of longer term things, like the longer term actions they kind of need to be right. If you're right 80% of the time and you do 10 things in a row, you're actually fairly likely to fail, right? And so if you, you kind of have to get that up to like 90, 99, you know, 99.9, .9 if you really want to be taking much longer sequences of actions. But I do think that we're going to start to see, you know, a lot of that performance happening over the next year or two. And that's going to be a pretty interesting, weird world where these things are actually working like kind of like we would expect as people. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Real quick, what's the easiest choice you can make? Taking the window instead of the middle seat, outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? <coughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded. And when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. 
Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time. Plus, Shopify Magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash cognitive. Go to shopify.com slash cognitive now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash cognitive. Omniki uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in Omniki so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount. Let me try to put a little taxonomy on, on some of this, you know, all these different approaches to improving reasoning. A number of the things you kind of said there from the RLHF, you know, the, the kind of supervision is, seems to be like late stage training techniques. And then I think I also heard echoes of one of my favorite podcasts that you guys did actually with Noam Brown um, of the Cicero, which is the AI playing diplomacy at human level ish, whatever paper. I hear echoes of that when you talk about using more compute at runtime. That was a huge takeaway uh, from that discussion for me. One thing that maybe didn't come up there as much is like curriculum learning, kind of pre training type stuff. Is that because you don't think that's as big of a deal? Or, you know, there's been a ton of people who've gone and said, let me, you know, rip a bunch of stuff from GPT 4. And then I'll train my open source model to like mimic the GPT-4 reasoning. And, you know, then often they'll like declare victory on some benchmark or something. But, you know, my general sense of that wave is that, you know, it's kind of passed now and for good reason, because mostly like nobody really, you know, got anywhere close to GPT-4, even if they, you know, managed to kind of hit, you know, a similar score on a particular benchmark. So it does seem like that finishing stuff is like maybe not enough. Um, spending more compute at runtime definitely seems like a potential huge unlock. I gather that maybe like that's kind of, you know, part of what Gemini is supposed to be maybe doing. You know, do you think that that finishing stuff like is more powerful than I'm giving it credit for? And then I'd love to hear your thoughts on the, the pre-training kind of curriculum learning side as well. There's three things. One other technique kind of on the finishing stuff and computer inference, it's, there's also things that are not just computer inference, but kind of asking a different question or trying to use the tools in different ways. I think those are kind of the places where we're more excited about getting a lot more gains. Like if you take a question and you really break it down into tons and tons of little pieces and then at, answer those questions and kind of like build those back up, you can get much, much better generations. And this is what we see with people that are making, you know, tools for writing novels or something like this. They don't just ask, like, write me a novel. Like they have a whole structure to it. And so you can think about how to break these things down. Maybe you could even start to break things down automatically. Like that kind of like, how do we use these tools in different ways? I think is much more high leverage than some of the other uh, approaches. Like you mentioned the pre-training one. I think there are interesting things that can be done in terms of like curriculum, pre-training. Actually, one of the companies that we uh, invested in recently has a researcher whose focus is on this in particular, which is, and I, they have some papers that show like you can actually take out you know, a decent fraction of the training data and not really her performance at all. And the net effect of that is that you can train faster. But these effects are more on the scale of like 2x in terms of like, you know, how much compute you have to put in to get there. It's not really helping you at the end of the day make a much better model because if you train, like you just need more data, but there isn't any more data. So, all right, fine. So the kind of the curriculum things, I think we're really getting kind of pretty good features from the way we're pre-training these models right now. And then the trick is like, how do we make these later stages, the fine tuning, the, you know, the other later data, the supervised fine tuning, the RLHF, how do we do this other stuff to kind of like push it in the right direction? And there, I think we can go a lot, lot further. Like there's some interesting stuff, you know, with like grokking with addition or modular addition, showing if you like really train it long enough and hard enough on these particular examples, it actually gets hundred percent accuracy on mod modular addition. And that's actually pretty interesting, especially from like a reasoning perspective. If we could get something that could reason in a much more robust way, that's actually quite interesting. So for us, we're interested in that kind of like generated data and data that's like really like using a lot, like making a lot of specific fine tuning data for these types of things that you really care about. I think you can push really hard on that, on that part of it as well.
Yeah, interesting. Boy, there's so many connections just between your one uh, statement there and like, you know, basically the whole field and uh, definitely a number of episodes that we've done as well. Like we did an episode with the founders of Illicit who have done some really good work on kind of breaking these you know problems down into their constituent parts. Boy, yeah, so many. Um, just an episode with um, Alex Watson, who's the founder of Gretel, which is a synthetic data company, which is a whole, you know, kind of interesting thing that I, you know, enjoyed going on a, a deep dive down the rabbit hole on. And then uh, maybe, the, maybe the thing that jumps out to me most about what we, we were just saying is you think we're getting pretty good features from the way that we're pre-training. Is that equivalent to saying you think that they're learning like a robust world model? So what's the difference between good features and a, you know, and a good world model? I am really interested in people working on systems that can learn better world models, but I do think that that will take a little bit more of a larger change in terms of how these systems actually work right now. Transformers are, and like large language models are language models. They're just statistical models of like, what is the probability that this word comes next? And that is a very powerful tool that we can use in different ways, but ultimately the kinds of features that they learn. Um, I think like the work by Chris Ola at Anthropic, you know, they had this uh, very interesting recent paper on kind of mechanistic interpretability and monosemanticity. And that is really interesting. That stuff is kind of saying like, look, you can see the features here. The features are like, does this look like a base 64 string? Does this look like Hebrew? Does this look like whatever? Does this look like a, you know, the word the in a mathematical context, the word the in a physics context, the word the in a social sciences context. Okay. That's kind of a weird feature. Why would I ever want that? But I think what they're doing is these transformers are taking these all these weird features of language uh, of like st statistical co-occurrence of words and using those to do the tasks that we actually care about. And it turns out that most of the tasks that we care about, you actually can solve in this really weird way without knowing anything about the world. And that's just a property of the types of questions that we normally ask and the property of the data and the training data and the, the distribution. You can ask really weird questions. Some people showed that like, you know, you can take, uh, print and length in Python and like reassign them to each other. So like length is print and print is length now, ha ha. And then the language model is just absolutely garbage at like tasks that, you know, afterwards. Whereas a person will realize like, this is weird, you shouldn't do that, but fine, I guess I can figure out what you're doing. The language model doesn't have the same ability to kind of tear apart the symbolic nature of these programs, right? Because it's just looking at the co-occurrences of words, never seen print used where it's supposed to be using length before. Uh, and so what we need, if we want to get more robust systems, has to change the kind of underlying thing to get to a better world model. So the stuff that work on like multimodality, those kind of things can help incentivize it. There's a bunch of other ways, the monosemanticity thing, you can imagine using the monosemanticity work to kind of do the like sparse autoencoder thing they did, and then kind of say like, yes, we actually want features that correlate to the real world. Let's use this as a way of making it more generalizable, more robust. So I think we'll start to see those kinds of things as we go kind of further and further into the future, and like people will figure out how to make these more robust and more anchored to the real world and thus, you know, kind of more useful, but that's going to be a little bit of a harder, longer thing. I don't think that's going to happen necessarily over the next year. Just as an aside for anyone who uh, hasn't heard it and wants a like 20 minute monologue on that paper, I did one um, in the, I think it was research roundup episode, not too long ago. You don't need it, but uh, some of the audience may not uh, may not be familiar with that yet. I do think that's phenomenally interesting work, and you know, hence the long monologue on it. So, does that put you in a, a position of disagreement with, or would you like reframe some of the things that we hear from, like an Ilya from OpenAI who says, when we train the language model, you know, just to predict the next token. What it actually learns is a whole representation of the world that generated that next token. It sounds like you don't really think about it that way. It does generate a representation, but I think my point is there are many different representations and some representations are better than others. And some of them correspond with reality and most of them don't in Transformers. And so I think that's kind of the point is like, there's lots and lots of representations. It learns a representation that might not be the best representation for your particular type of task or the particular way in which you want to generalize. Physics is all about us finding simpler and simpler representations, right? Like mass and velocity. These are like really useful concepts. You can distill a lot of information down to like just these small number of quantities and be very predictive. You're not getting quite the same thing in Transformers. And we can see this kind of provably in small toy cases. Like you look at addition, for example. Addition, transformers do not learn general purpose addition. At best, they learn what is mo called modular addition, which is addition in like a fixed size set of things. And that's because of the like 
type of programs that transformers can learn. What that means is they cannot generalize like sort of provably to longer sequences in the same way that you and I can generalize to longer sequences of addition. However, uh, Hattie, one of our friends recently, just had a really cool paper about this showing that actually you can change the structure of the information coming in for addition by putting these kind of like prefix markers so that the transformer can learn a different type of program, a simpler, better type of program for addition, and that does generalize. And so the original thing that's being learned here is just this kind of bad way of thinking about it where it like, you know, it's doing it in this like really weird trigonometric space and adding these things together, which is not how you're supposed to do addition. It's fine. It's fine for modular addition, but not for regular addition. But this other one lets you learn the actual algorithm for addition, which is simpler than the modular one. And so that is kind of saying like, look, if you structure the data correctly, or if you structure your network correctly, you can get better representations. I think this addition case is a good example. It's nice and simple and easy to see. But I think we see the same thing across all different tasks, like probably most different tasks are like this as well. Especially like, this is why when you ask GPT-4, you know, draw me a unicorn, or is it safe to put a baby in a dishwasher? It's like, it doesn't really have the right like concepts to quite answer these quite correctly, but we will get there as we start to add more data to it, either from multimodality, putting these markers in there, putting our own biases in there, et cetera. Yeah. How do you see the multimodality? You know, I guess if I had to summarize my own sense of this, I do feel like there is some very meaningful reasoning going on in these systems. I often say, you know, AI is alien intelligence because you know, as with that grokking result, it's like, boy, that's a weird way to do it. You know, it certainly doesn't seem to be anything like what I'm doing, but it is, you know, getting the right answer. And yet, you know, in some cases it can be like superhuman in other cases it can be like amazingly stupid and surprise, you know, in things that would, you know, seemingly be surprisingly obvious, but with the addition of the image understanding, it does seem to have taken a notable step up where now it's like, it, it seems like increasingly hard to argue that there's not some, you know, pretty significant world model, you know, in there, right? I mean, because these random snapshot scenes that it's able to handle so, so well, clearly they were not in the training data, right? I just took that picture. So how do you think about kind of the the difference that the addition of, say, vision, but new modalities in general is making? Yeah, I think it, you know, it's kind of related to what I was just saying. The modalities act a lot, I think, like these sort of prefix markers from Hattie's paper. The prefix markers in addition are making it easier for the transformer to learn a simpler representation of the world. Similarly with pictures, if you see a picture of a cat and then you read all these stories about cats, it's like, oh, okay, like you kind of have to end up with representations that are a little bit more similar. And so I think that's kind of how I think about it is that it's helping force these towards more general, more robust um, things. In particular, Images are interesting, but I think probably the most interesting version of this are videos, especially kind of like causal interaction videos, first person videos, these types of things. And with you know good descriptions of what's going on, that kind of stuff. I think once you're really predicting, you know, what is happening in a video, like of a summary of, of a whole long, long video in the world, it's pretty hard to, to fit that data plus this other text and plus these all these other videos you end up, it constrains the representation so much that I think it'll probably generalize relatively. We'll have like much, much better representations, I think, as we add all these other modalities in. How much do you think you can separate reasoning and knowledge? You know, you might imagine, and there have been attempts like this where people kind of train a language model on just like a bunch of pure math or a bunch of kind of logical sort of deductions that, you know, could even be just like programmatically generated. And you know, then the the hope would be you have some sort of, you know, reasoning model that comes out of that, that might not know literally anything about the world. And, you know, in that case, it could be true to say, like, you've just been trained on pure logic, you know, nothing about the world. How separable do you think those things ultimately are going to be? I think it's, that's that's an interesting question as well. It's difficult. Like, what do we mean by reasoning? What do we mean by knowledge? These things are very, very connected. And there's different types of knowledge, right? There's the knowledge of like, how many people live in Tunisia and there's a the knowledge of like how to swing a golf club. And these are also two totally separate types of knowledge. I think we're going to start to get better terms and tools for breaking these things down and being a little more specific about what we mean in the next few years, which is very exciting. You know, yeah, as you said, you can definitely make things that learn, you know, logic puzzle uh, type things very well. One of the internal experiments we did as a sort of toy experiment, we were looking at these things. I think they're called like 
Einstein puzzles. I don't know why they're called that, but just those things from, you know, like third grade where it's like Billy and Sally and Jenny have, you know, each have one object. The objects are red and blue and green. One of them is a blah. One of them, this person has this one. This one has one that isn't like that one. Like, and then who has the red object? Uh, like those kind of things. And you have to like, you know, do this logical inference to figure it out. We found that even ridiculously small transformers are able to do really well on this. Right. And so they don't really know anything about the world. Like you can ask them all sorts of other questions. They don't, they're trash at everything else, but they're really good at like this type of reasoning, right? This like quote unquote reasoning. That's just like one type of reasoning too, right? It's a very, very specific small set. I would say that reasoning is probably like a set of heuristics or skills or ways of transforming information. So knowledge is pretty related to that because if you have no information, it's kind of hard to transform it. Yeah, I think that's kind of how I would separate the two, but I don't think we have the perfect terms for this yet and we're still kind of figuring them out. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash cognitive. That's oracle.com slash cognitive. oracle.com slash cognitive. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash cognitive. That's netsuite.com slash cognitive to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash cognitive. Yeah, micro reasoning skills, I think, is definitely an interesting paradigm. Kind of, you know, in the end, you may have just a huge number of very specific heuristics that that kind of get deployed. Although that does still raise the question of kind of insight, right? And or, or like I sometimes call these eureka moments. And you know, I think this is maybe like the the biggest question, even perhaps bigger than like, can we get you know reliable agents? Would be like. Can we get to a point where models can like figure things out that experts don't know, you know, and, and really kind of come up with things that are not, you, I was about to say not in the training data, but that may not even be the thing, right? Like uh, some of the recent stuff I've been looking at too with, oh, hey, here's a technique to have a 10 million token context window or whatever. When I think about that and I think about 10 million tokens fully attending to each other, it's like, there's a lot in that training data perhaps that people have not in fact, you know, identified or, or learned everything that they could from. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Like, what, what do you think is the kind of outlook for, let's say, like, eureka moments, you know, truly novel insights out of generalist systems? I don't think that it's going to be a very um, discreet or a very different thing. I think that as we make them much better at reasoning, as we make them better at acting in the world, we're, all, we're already going to start to see these things. And in fact, you can already sort of, if you squint at it, kind of make this claim for existing things like some of the patterns that it finds in, you know, proteins or some of these other things that people don't necessarily have the same intuition for are already kind of interesting, certainly, you know, more interesting than I would have thought of. So maybe there's someone in the, in the world who has a much better intuition about these things than me, but I think pretty soon we're going to start to find ones that are actually novel in, in a pretty interesting way. Yeah, I don't think that that'll be a two of us like too separate of a thing. So let's talk about some of the, the projects that you guys have done and uh, published out of Imbue. Maybe for starters, because you were talking about like the multimodality and the learning from video, for example, you created a 
training environment, as I understand it, for agents that is kind of a, you know, Garden of Eden sort of thing where, you know, and I went and looked at some of the videos and, and some of the simulations. Basically, it's like uh, meant to be fast, right, which is one thing and kind of like a substitute perhaps for like a, a Roblox, uh, you know, where you have like a, a big environment, but it's like slow to deal with. Here, you've got this kind of quick, computationally efficient, natural environment. And the idea is that like agents can kind of explore it and try to figure out how to do stuff. Um, and they're doing this in a totally like wordlessly, textlessly, uh, you know, knowledge free other than just kind of the environment that they're in environment. So I'd lo love to hear a little bit about that project and, you know, whether or not any agents have actually um, accomplished much now that um, it's out there for people to train on. So yeah, that project we started on actually almost two years ago now. So uh, at least a year and a half ago. And the main purpose of that, but prior to that, we'd done a lot of work on self-supervised learning and made some very cool systems that can learn things like completely autonomously, like much like a child, you know, has no, like, even if you just leave a person alone, they'll figure out like what are objects, et cetera. Uh, so we had this, but you know, you can have a self-supervised system that's learning all sorts of things, but what should you learn? And so we were kind of experimenting more with reinforcement learning and figuring out like what matters to learn. Like you don't want to spend all your time looking at the pattern on the wall or something like that. You want to like find food and stay alive and all these other things. So we have as people like biases about what information is and is not important. So this, you know, as we started exploring that and exploring reinforcement learning, we realized that one of the big things holding the field back was a lack of benchmarks where these other more complicated um, abilities like curiosity or novelty or exploration would actually matter. In Atari, you don't, you just kind of get penalized for that stuff. It's not usually very helpful, except on maybe a small handful of games. And then there's kind of like, are you overfitting to this, et cetera. So we wanted to make something that kind of like had a much bigger set of things that you could do a much more challenging, much more open world, you know, and that's why we made it kind of procedurally generated and, and like much larger and everything. We also spent a lot of time, you know, because reinforcement learning is like much less efficient than most learning. So we spent a lot of time making sure it's very efficient. You know, I think it ended up being on the order of a hundred times faster than Minecraft, et cetera. And what that allowed us to do is to play around with agents on a wide variety of tasks of a varying range of difficulties and see what do our current reinforcement learning systems, what are they really good at doing? And what we found is that they're actually fairly good at learning these kind of behaviors. Like it learns to open door, for example, even with like complicated locks and bars and all these kinds of things. But it mostly does it by like bouncing next to the door and like jiggling things until it like finally succeeds. If you watch it, you, you would definitely struggle to say that it like understood how to open a door. It does find a strategy for opening a door. But then as you like keep letting it go, it'll find a more and more efficient strategy for opening the door. But this is not at all how we open doors. We turn the handle and pull it open because we know how the mechanism works after we've kind of learned it. So we, we published that work last year at NeurIPS, you know, almost, yeah, almost a year ago. Uh, but we had submitted it you know, a year and a half ago. And after we had submitted it, we started working on actually adding multiple agents and adding language and adding other things to this environment. And as we started doing that, uh, we started realizing like, wow, there's all these different tasks you could do. You know, you could put Atari in here and have it play Atari. You could put a web browser in here and have it work on a web browser. You could do this other stuff. And as you start kind of giving them plans or, you know, higher level actions and these kind of like reasoning things, then it's much, much easier to accomplish these harder tasks that for, you know, PPO or these simple reinforcement learning things are just way too hard to do. I think if, you know, most of the work that we do, most of the tasks that we succeed at we're not using reinforcement learning to learn this, right? Like that's not how you get a PhD. You don't try getting a PhD 10,000 times and then you finally get it and you say, oh, I guess I should do more of that to get my PhD. Like that's not at all how we do almost everything, right? We're mostly planning. We're mostly thinking and anticipating and like using this kind of logical reasoning stuff. And so that's why we've kind of shifted our focus towards those types of tasks, towards the like coding tasks, reasoning tasks, tasks in your browser, desktop, where the planning piece is there. And, you know, we still have all the reinforcement learning stuff. We still know where those things are good. Those are great for like figuring out which button to click or those kind of like lower level behavior type things or guiding the system. But they're kind of like two complementary techniques. Yeah, especially, I guess, the things that are kind of wordless, like, the, you know, speaking of Eureka moments, there was just this really interesting result I'm sure you saw about using GPT-4 to write reward models that were then used to you know, drive the reinforcement learning and even to teach a, a robot hand to twirl a pencil. And it's like, yeah, there's really no, um, that's a hard one to communicate, right? I can't, um, that is one of those things that you kind of have to just learn by, by just stumbling at it, you know, a bunch until you learn it. So it's funny, I'm, I'm always a little reluctant to take too much like inspiration from humans into my understanding of AIs, because I always think, you know, I'm just worried about 
smuggling confusion in with analogies, but then it is also just often pretty compelling <laughs> that like, you know, there are some insights there to be uh, gleaned, no doubt. So got to be careful with that stuff. Coding agents, you know, is kind of the the big shift in focus. And I understand that this was, if I, if I understand correctly, this was kind of a driver of the recent fundraise. In a recent interview, you know, it was kind of without too much detail, uh, indicated that like a demo was, you know, the kind of the key moment that got people, you know, compelled enough by what you guys are building to write a whatever, however many figures a $200 million check is. So tell me about the the agenda now on the coding agent side. Yeah, actually, yeah, you just mentioned uh, Eureka, which is a paper by Jim Fan's group. Uh, and also another previous one of his was Voyager. Uh, and both of these are, in the case of Eureka, it's writing a reward model or like, you know, adjusting the reward model, a dense reward model is what it's really doing. That paper already, like you have to know if you can succeed or not. It has a sparse reward model and we're densifying it here. Uh, and in the Voyager paper, they're writing like little skills using this library of tools, like, you know, an API for Minecraft. How do you put together these different skills to do slightly higher level tasks? In both of those cases, you're making a much better reinforcement learning agent by writing code effectively. And so one of the like really interesting things for us, one of the things, one of the reasons we're so focused on code is that it's actually just really useful with these, you know, these are two like concrete examples of like things that Jim Fan has published, but there's other types of things that you can do as well. There's other types of ways that you can use code to make better reinforcement learning agents. And so I think that actually writing code is going to become like a really important part of how we even develop and run these agents in the first place. It's not just going to be like, oh, you know, we're making coding agents so the developers can write better code for their like web apps or whatever. Now, I think that most of the new code that's going to be written is actually going to be more like as in the inner loop of these agents, right? How do they help optimize their own prompts? How do they help select which few shot examples to do? How do they learn from those experiences by like automatically pulling out different pieces or automatically breaking down these problems? So there's a lot of really interesting stuff that you can do once, you, once your agent can start to write some code. I mean, I see the same pattern in a lot of different domains where you have kind of the highest level reasoning system, whether it's a self-driving car planner or, you know, an autonomous drone, you know, kind of, you know, navigation system, or even, you know, just some of the frameworks, right, that, that folks are using, or even, you know, to uh, break my rule and say like an analogy, I feel like kind of even myself, there's this like difference in frequency where you have the high level thing that kind of runs a little bit slow, but kind of gives some sort of structured commands down to lower level systems that then like execute those and report results back and, you know, raise errors as needed. Is that basically the, the kind of framework and structure that you are expecting to work? It's part of it. I think in the case of like self-driving cars or most of the systems that we have today, the breakdown has been done by a person. Like we kind of think about it like, well, I guess we need some vision. I guess we have lanes to follow. I guess we have this. I guess we have that. We've done the breakdown part. I think what's interesting for me for the future systems is that they'll be able to break these things down more autonomously. And that's actually kind of part of the demo and that, you know, kind of led to the fundraise and everything is how do you break these things down in a way that's not just a person coming in and putting in all of their you know knowledge about how to solve the problem. So yes, I think overall, you do want to have like different levels of abstraction. You want to have something at the highest level that knows a goal and it's kind of like orchestrate some lower level things and that's broken down. And the reason for this is like these real tasks, like when you're trying to do, you know, not just demos, they span many levels of abstraction. There's a lot of complexity in the real world, right? Like, you know, you think about like Stripe or something. It's like, how can there be so many people working in Stripe? Like all you're doing is paying for a thing online. How hard can that be? Turns out really hard. turns out there's a lot of details to that kind of stuff, right? But it turns out everything is like that. And so if we have a system that can more automatically break these things down and like actually start solving these problems and putting them back together properly again, I think it's going to look, you know, broad strokes kind of similar, but in a sense, it'll be quite different because this can happen dynamically. This can change over time. You might be able to come back to the system and say, you know what, we have this like kind of, you know, we're using this language model here, but it's doing something stupid. Like we're just doing addition. Let's just call Wolfram Alpha. Or let's just use a calculator. Okay, great. Now it's a lot faster. And so once this is kind of more dynamic, it's going to be more evolving. It's going to be able to like optimize and like, you know, continually improve in a way that's much, much harder for like a self-driving car system that's been made by, you know, whole huge teams of people. So I don't know how much you can tell us about uh, at this point, you know, what that demo looked like, but I, you know, certainly would love to hear more of the details. And then I'm also kind of wondering what language models were you using in the core of this thing? Like, you know, one way to do it would be to go use GPT-4 and have it, 
you know, serve part of the thing. I don't know if you have trained your own large scale models so far, although I, I know that, you know, with the Rays and the 10,000 uh, H100s that are uh, a part of that deal, that's certainly in the future. So where are you guys right now in terms of like building your own core language models versus using others? And yeah, to the degree you can, like what, uh, what are the capabilities that you're starting to see unlocked? Well, we had our own cluster even back then. It was not on the same scale. We'd already trained actually hundreds or maybe thousands of language models by that time as part of CARBs actually are like um, hyperparameter optimizer. So we did have, you know, some language models of our own. There's also open source ones that we can fine tune. And, you know, there are ones like OpenAI and, and Claude. So the demo actually used a mix of all of this stuff in different ways. And you can kind of update them and see like, okay, how, how well does this one work? How well does that one work? What happens if you fine tune it, et cetera? It wasn't always strictly better to use GPT-4. In some cases, you, you do want to be able to, you know, run this really quickly or run a whole bunch of these in parallel. And there's definitely rate limits and things like that. So there are different pieces um, of this. So even back then, it was still useful to use a mix. You know, since then, we've been able to train much larger ones and kind of that's the stuff that we're working on now. We finally have our compute coming online and can like actually start to train much larger ones. Um, so that's pretty interesting. That's a lot of the work that we'll be doing over the next year or two is kind of improving those. In terms of like what the demo actually was, it was really us making some a, a few different processes actually for automatically breaking down specific types of questions on specific kind of academic data sets and showing that like, look, if you kind of break these down in these automated ways that are actually not really that complicated, then you can get much, much better answers when you then take those answers and like reassemble them back into the final answer. And I think people since have actually published uh, some of these kinds of things that we are doing as various um, different types of, uh, of academic papers. So it's been nice to see like, oh, okay, that wasn't just like a one-off thing. That seems like a technique that actually like generally applies more applicable or is like a more generally applicable type of a thing. For example, like, yeah, like some of the, you know, tree of thought type stuff was very similar to some of the things that we were working on. Of like, okay, if you break it down in this different way, you have different uncertainties. How do you explore those? How do you bring those back? Um, you can also think about like, yeah, not all of them have made their way to uh, academic papers quite yet, but, you know, some, some of them have. And so it's been nice to see that. But yeah, at, at a high level, it's basically just that. I think one of the data sets that we focused on was... Um, ANLI, the Adversarial Natural Language Inference uh, data set out of Facebook, where the goal, you know, is to say, okay, here's this context, here's this hypothesis, like, is the hypothesis true or false, or you can't tell? And this is, you know, a pretty useful thing from the perspective of reasoning, because you really want to know, like, is this right or wrong? And that's like a very, very helpful thing. And it's called Adversarial Natural Language Inference, because it's about people trying to trick the language models. So this has a bunch of really good examples of things where it's like, yep, the language model gets it wrong. Okay, why is that? Oh, it's actually because when you break this apart, you start to see, oh, I see, it got like confused about like, you know, this song was written by X and Y. And if you just ask if it was written by just X, and it just says yes, because the word is just there and you're like, fine. But once you break it apart and you're like, okay, who are all the authors of this, et cetera, then the answer becomes sort of obvious. So once you make the and this is, it's kind of a similar thing to chain of thought. Chain of thought, what it's doing is it's kind of like spelling out the information for the language model. So it's easier for the attention to kind of force the right tokens to happen. But you don't have to do that just with chain of thought. You can also do that by breaking it down. You can generate questions to ask and then answer those questions. You can look at the uncertainty. You can explore these things in different ways. So we had just a whole suite of different things for doing that, for breaking them down and showed like much, much better performance on this task. Now, who cares about ANLI in particular? Like, we didn't care about publishing this particular thing and wrapping it up and everything. But the point was like, look, you can really like kind of solve these problems by breaking them down this way. We should go make this actually useful. Yeah. So again, it's kind of an echo of the more compute at runtime playing a big role there. On the compute. So, you know, this is a topic of so much speculation. So NVIDIA is one of the investors in the round, right? And I was just doing a little back of the envelope math and, you know, something is not, I'm not, I'm missing something in this analysis. So you can kind of help me figure out where I'm going wrong, but $200 million raise. I just looked online at the price, the going price of a H100. And if I were to buy 10,000 of them by the like retail math, that seems to come out to $300 million, you know, all on its own. So either like you're getting a deal somewhere or, you know, there's some sort of financing that's Im implied in this. Can you give us a little more kind of unpacking of the nature of your access to all this compute? Yeah. So we're working closely with a new compute provider, Voltage Park, 
uh, and they are setting up this much larger cluster. They're the ones who actually bought. We originally were thinking, oh, should we buy them? Should we not? Because we, we bought our own before, but this is a much larger amount. It's like, oh, should we buy it? We're going to be locked into this for so long. So they actually ended up buying this huge amount of compute, and we are getting the compute through them. And so we're not going to have the compute for the entire lifetime of this thing, but we will have the compute, like the reason we, you know, so they can get a much larger cluster. We can use that much larger cluster without spending all the money that we raised. So that's kind of how it works is we're planning on spending it over a shorter amount of time uh, than the entire lifetime of the chip. That dynamic in and of itself is, um, is definitely super interesting. When you think about this cluster, 10,000 H100s, I, I've been fascinated lately by just trying to do a little bit of what I call time to GPT-4 math. And, you know, obviously nobody knows exactly like what, um, you know, the the total flops into GPT-4 were. We have a sense that it's maybe something around 10 to the 25, whatever. And then if I just kind of start doing the math of, okay, well, an H100 can do like roughly 10 to the 15 flops. And, you know, how, how does that kind of trickle down to how long does it take me in, say, days with a cluster of 10,000 H100s to get to GPT-4 flop scale? Depending on the assumptions or whatever, it's like three to seven days. And that's like a startlingly short time. Three to seven days for GPT-4. That's a little bit off of my own estimate. But uh, I guess how big are you assuming GPT-4 is? I'm doing 10 to the 25 for GPT-4. Flops or parameters or? Total flops in. So basically working, you know, saying it's just assuming it's one order of magnitude less than like the 10 to the 26, you know, recently uh, declared, you know, reporting threshold. And then I'm putting four uh, times 10 to the 15th device flops, which is what I understand the spec to be if you're doing eight digit quantization in your training. Uh, yeah, you can't quite do that. Yeah. What would you estimate uh, time to GPT-4 to be? And you know, how, how do you kind of back into that? I mean, the, the best I have is this is from some other source, uh, I think, online saying that probably took about 30,000 A100s for about, you know, five months or three to five months, something like that. Now, we don't know, is that like all the training? Is that just the last run? I don't know. But like, that, it's like kind of, you know, roughly right order of magnitude. It also checks out if you figure out, you know, how many parameters it was, I think there was something saying, oh, maybe it's like a mixture of experts with eight experts each, you know, 200 billion parameters or whatever, which again, makes sense. Like back of the envelope, that seems like kind of roughly where you'd want to be. They're probably going to be doing it roughly chinchilla optimal type training, maybe a little bit of overtraining, you know, for something like that. Uh, Mosaic actually had a good blog post recently. Well, not recently anymore, a while ago, looking at how long it takes to train networks of various sizes. I think for theirs, they estimated that on their Mosaic cluster, you know, for a 30 billion parameter model uh, to train Chinchilla Optimal, it needed 600 uh, billion tokens. And so it took about, you know, a month to train. If you take that and you kind of scale it up to, let's say, you know, a 4,000 H100 cluster, then I think you can train maybe a 200 billion parameter model in like 45 days. So... It's going to take a while if you're just training, you know, a 1.6 trillion parameter model. But our strategy is not necessarily to train the absolute largest model possible, but rather, I think if you look at the GPT-4 technical report and you look at those perplexity curves, like you see them go down like this. And then if you look, it's like, okay, this point is here. This other point is here. It has one one hundredth as much compute and you've only lost like a tiny bit in performance. And so I think our perspective is like, look, I'd rather spend, you know, if you're going to spend, you know, a billion dollars on, on this one training run, I'd rather spend $10 million on the training run and then get my performance increase somewhere else. Like, can I make it better in any other way? If even three or four or 5% is going to make a huge difference there. So I think that's kind of how we're thinking about it is we'll train very large models, but the goal will be to push on these other things to try and make the performance better instead of just trying to make it big. That also makes it easier from a data perspective. You don't need as much data to, to train those much smaller models as well. Yeah, it's that's definitely really interesting. So it seems like you're not conceiving of this compute cluster as like a giant laser that you're going to point at a single target, at least not very often, if ever. That's not our strategy. It's just a different bet. Like Anthropic and OpenAI, they're the ones exploring the like super high scale models. It seems like, you know, from 
Llama and from these other models, you can get really good performance from these smaller models. Like when we fine tune Llama, we see better than GPT-4 performance on a lot of tasks. And so, you know, do we really need to spend that much? Like maybe, you know, maybe our next cluster will be super gigantic. But for now, I think we can get real, real far with ones that are still very large. You know, 200 billion parameters is the size of one of those heads, right? So it's, it's still quite big. In fact, in a sense, like that's really what you're getting in the inference pass anyway, if you're kind of assigning only to certain heads, right? So we think we'll probably get relatively close. And I'd much rather spend 45 days training something than, you know, a year. Yeah. So what is it about, the, you mentioned, you kind of, you know, reacted when I said the eight digit um, quantization. My read of the literature recently has been that like quantization, certainly at runtime, you know, you've seen people going all the way down to like three digits, but even in training, it seems like the trend is toward like fewer and fewer digits, but you think just eight is one step too far? Like would you, you train at 16? Yeah. I mean, I think for now you might want to train at 16. You're, you're welcome to train at, at, you know, eight for smaller models. I think as they get bigger, you have larger risks of them diverging and there's other sorts of problems that happen. And, you know, you might not get quite the same performance that you were expecting as you're doing the FP8 stuff. So there's still a few more kinks to be worked out, I think. And NVIDIA is working on those. And, and you know, we're, we're also looking at those, but I think that just, just be careful. And like all the literature looks and, you know, the demos and everything look great, but I think just it, you're doing this at home and going to spend a few million on something like just it's not quite that easy. Is there sort of a um, progression that might also make sense there? Like obviously in the early going, you know, the, the curve is steep, right? seems like you could get away in the early going with like eight digit. And then maybe at some point, you know, as the curve gets flatter and the, you know, you're starting to like decrease your learning rate, you know, in a schedule, then maybe you like, say, hey, now we'll flip into a few extra digits mode. And the curve's flat for most of the training. When you look at the curves, it's like first, you know, 10, 20%, you're getting this big improvement. And then for the last 80 to 90%, it's just this slow, slow grind. So you're not really saving yourself too much. And now you have the extra complexity of flipping from one to the other. So yeah, it's possible. Um, and I do think it's possible to do with FBA. I think you just need to be careful. I think it's just easy to have like accumulation, uh, like precision errors that, that end up biting you. Well, that's uh, the kind of expertise that uh, we're looking to unlock little nuggets of here. So that's that's cool. You mentioned also this uh, CARBS framework that you guys have developed for uh, cost aware. Mm, what's the R? But <laughs> it's, it's Pareto region. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So so this is you know natural segue to that work, right? Of kind of figuring out well, you know, what should the learning rate be, and do, do these kinds of things, you know, work and pay off or not. I haven't had a chance to absorb this work in depth, but you use some very uh, compelling, basically like GIF level graphics of it, which I'm always a big fan of that kind of show the systematic exploration of the Pareto curve and kind of, you know, just gradually, incrementally, you know, bit by bit pushing it out. Tell us a little bit about that work and um, I'll follow up there on the, the parts that kind of jump out to me most. Yeah, CARBS is actually super exciting and super handy and useful when we're doing our own research. It actually came about as a result of just the way you normally do machine learning research when you start out is like, okay, you train your network, it kind of works. You're like, huh, I wonder if I need to change the learning rate. You try a few different ones. You're kind of like always poking at this manually. And then at some point you're like, oh, maybe I should do like a grid search or maybe I should do this optimization. But then a grid search is really inefficient. And then you're like, ah, oh, well, maybe I could find like a smarter way of picking which things to do. Okay, well, are, is there stuff in literature about this? Yeah, I mean, if you have something that kind of works, you can do a sort of local search with Bayesian optimization. That's like one half of it uh, is Bayesian optimization. And the other half is this natural evolutionary strategies. Really, CARBS is just gluing these two together and making it so that the program is calculating which like thing to poke at and try next. And this is nice because it can do a much better job than us in these very, very high dimensional spaces. When you're considering, you know, 10 or 12 different parameters, it's really hard as a person to know, like, where's the optimal place to put a point to learn the most, especially in like a cost aware sense. So this tool really emerged from like our own use and just, you know, not wanting to have to mess with it. And now we have it at a point where you can kind of just hit go, go to sleep, wake up. And when you, by the time you wake up, it's run tons and tons of language models of different sizes. And you can see this nice curve and you can see how not just the like data and compute change with scale, but how all the parameters change the scale. And you can say, okay, I kind of see like, oh, it's like, it seems like it's adding more and more heads. It's changing the KV size in this way. Oh, like, it looks like if I wanted to make this much, much bigger, I would want to be here and can kind of like pick these points a little bit better than otherwise you'd be able to, and start to see like really interesting new types of scaling laws and these other parameters that are kind of different and a little more subtle as well. Yeah. So it's kind of the automated discovery of 
scaling laws. And it sounds like it's, when I think of hyperparameters, typically I think of those as kind of being outside of the definition of the model. But it sounded like you're also even looking at like different widths, different numbers of heads. Um, so basically different, different model structures too. Yeah, you can extend this to network architecture search if you really wanted to. Uh, but the nice thing about CARVs is that it's robust to any parameters. So things we can tune are things that are otherwise kind of difficult to tune because like, you know, maybe as you make your batch size bigger and bigger, eventually you run out of memory and it crashes. Well, CARVs can kind of account for this automatically and say like, okay, it, this is like the region where it's crashing. So I'm going to sort of automatically adjust to stay out of that region because I'm getting bad performance over there. And the thing is, in practice, yeah, like batch size is easy if you're just scaling this up, of course, you know, don't make it too big. But some of these things start to interact in different ways, right? Like as you have more and more parameters, larger and larger batch size, like you kind of run out of memory at different places and it's hard to code up exactly where that threshold is. So it's sort of a little bit easier just to like let it go uh, and figure out like which of these networks actually work. I think it'd be interesting to extend it to network architecture search, but I don't know if the network architectures actually make that much of a difference. Like the architecture, the transformer architectures are pretty good so, yeah, I'm not sure if that's the first thing that we'll do, but it is something we're interested in doing eventually. Yeah, another thing that kind of occurs to me in this, and if I understand correctly, this is all fully explicit code, right? You, like you guys have coded every line of this and know exactly what it does. And but it does kind of strike me that, like, you know, when you said this thing can like work better in these high dimensional spaces than humans can, that that set off for me like, well, you know, no one else can sometimes work better in high dimensional spaces is a model, right? So is there a way in which this is like potentially creating the training data or like mapping out the space that you might eventually end up with a model that makes these sorts of predictions? Does that seem like uh, a realistic next evolution of this? Yeah, uh, right now, if you look at the paper, the, the so we mean model in a few different senses. One model, it's using a like a Gaussian process, like it's using a very simple model of like, how do these parameters change? That's not really the right model to use. Like it's not quite the right prior for some of these things. And if you did know the actual scaling law, you could put the true like model of this thing in there and then it would scale, it would like know this much, much better and it would be much more data efficient. So that's one type of model that would be really interesting to put in there. Another type of model is to like learn which type of model you're supposed to put in there in the first place, which I think is kind of what you're getting to. Like if you use a transformer to kind of model these spaces and guess, okay, with these hyperparameters, what will my performance be? Actually, Google had some pretty interesting um, research on this, I think maybe about a year ago or something like that. And yeah, it did seem to like work for their types of workloads. You need a lot of data for those types of systems to work. Um, so I'm not 100% sure if that'll be the first thing that we do. But it is an interesting method of exploration. And then the final like model, like way of integrating a model would be, well, what you really want for carbs is what these things always look like is kind of a line that goes up and then kind of tapers off. Like you can only tune your parameters so much, right? And you're going to get to like saturating uh, areas. And then at that point, what you do as a person is you're like, okay, great. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to explore these new axes. Well, what are those new axes? Those new axes are new configuration values that you have to implement in your network. Okay. Well, you might be able to write some of those, right? Or maybe you could automatically pull in ideas from open source literature, or maybe you could, you know, generate variants of a function that you have that's kind of slow or that seems important. And you could use a transformer or a coding agent or something like this to generate those variants that you want to explore. And I think that would be another interesting way of like using a model in this loop. Uh, that would be kind of fun to explore. But that one I think is also kind of a little difficult. Maybe we'll wait a little while until these coding agents are a little more robust before we do that. But it would be cool. Yeah, you guys have a very sort of eclectic um, portfolio of things that you've put out. And um, I guess that's kind of a reflection of what I understand to be a sort of unique and kind of curiosity-driven culture at the company. So comment on that all you want. But uh, the next one that I wanted to touch on too is this stepwise self-supervised learning uh, paper that came out of, a few months ago. And you know, this one I've really stared at a bit and and tried to develop my intuition for. And I feel like I'm making progress, but I don't have still quite as much of an intuition for what's going on there as I would like. So just for a setup very briefly, like you're using an old school data set of the, the um, CFAR 10, 10 different classes of images and teaching like a relatively small network to identify like which type of image is this. 
And then you do something that I, again, I find fascinating, but I'm not quite getting, I'm not quite grokking it myself, I guess, which is take a purely analytical mathematical approach to figuring out what you expect to happen and then mm-hmm. confirming that that is in fact what happens. And in both cases, what seems to happen is like one feature comes online at a time and it comes online very suddenly or re- relatively suddenly. And you can kind of see these like, uh, you know, sudden drops in the loss curve, which seem to correspond to these like sudden grokking, I guess, maybe, I don't know if you would use that term or not, of these new features. And that's about as far as I've got. But I'd love to understand a little bit better the intuition for the math on the analytical side for like why we should expect this in the first place. And then like how you understand this. Is it, is it akin to grokking or is it something different? All I know is I'm fascinated by it, but I don't quite get it yet. This was a very interesting research project. This actually started with an intern uh, and it did, as you said, kind of start in this very kind of curiosity driven way. I think he was just training some network or maybe was watching one of us train some networks and like, huh, like that just looks really weird. Like, why does that loss have those notches in it? Like that does not, that's not what we'd expect. Oh yeah, I think that's what it was. I think he was doing a like really toy simple version. I think he was trying to get it to like an analytical version of this because his background is more on the theory and math side. And as he trained it, he like noticed this like very strange kind of stepwise thing as he like took it away from the like really complicated, you know, fully maxed out thing that gets state of the art and back to the slightly simpler form and seeing this, this kind of pattern and thinking like, why is that actually happening? And this project kind of evolved out of that of us investigating it and then looking at the theory side, like, why is that happening? One of the things that we're interested in as a company is this kind of like deep learning theory, but we mean deep learning theory, not in the like, you know, pointless bounds on like, you know, parody problems, but rather like the practical, like how do these things actually work questions. So very practical kind of applications of theory. Um, And this was an example of that, us trying to figure out what's actually happening in these self-supervised image learning systems. So here, it's not exactly the same as grokking. I encourage people to to check out the blog post and everything to take a look at it, because it is very visual and it's very interesting to see the loss go down in these steps. What's really happening is that, you know, it's learning a kind of direction of the data at a time. So that if we take a step back there, like deep learning is actually sort of different than a lot of classical machine learning in a very particular way. We don't know what that particular way is as a field yet exactly. And so the thing that is different, we call feature learning. Okay. Feature learning is everything that isn't kernel learning. We know a lot about kernel learning. Kernel methods like support vector machines, almost all other kind of earlier machine learning things are kind of like kernel methods. Kernel methods are measuring like similarities or distances between different data points in different ways. And you can use this to kind of make like, if you have a classifier, you can make like a separating hyperplane to say like, this is the one class, this is the other class. And like, here's the border with the features, like this is where the border is. The thing, you know, and support vector machines are a great example of this. They like make this border, you like try and make it as far away from each class at the same time, kind of balancing your false positives and false negatives. There's like an optimal place to put it, nice and easy. We know a lot about kernel methods and how they work. Kernel methods, however, take the kernel as fixed. You have to decide how am I gonna measure the similarity between two data points before you start doing your learning. Deep learning, on the other hand, does not say that. It does not have a kernel that is fixed. Instead, the kernel changes over time. Uh, and that's the like feature learning part of it. Now, it turns out that you can kind of take what we do for deep learning and turn it into a kind of kernel problem. And this is the neural tangent kernel. So recently in the past few years, people have made this thing called the neural tangent kernel, which is saying, look, actually deep learning in infinite width networks a network is actually a kernel learning system and it's not evolving at all when it's infinite width. And so then we can make this approximation and just pretend it's a kernel method. And now we all know all these things about it. You can even calculate the kernel. You can do all this kind of weird stuff. It's very interesting. But those approximations, those infinitely wide networks are actually not as good as the finitely wide ones. And that's because this feature learning doesn't happen. Okay, so in these cases, so this paper, really what it's saying is Actually, what's happening in self-supervised learning is mostly kernel learning. It's mostly learning like kind of kernel PCA, like an unsupervised kind of like, what are the main like eigendirections of the data and of this kernel? There is some other stuff that's happening. You know, these, these other networks do perform a little bit better, but if we kind of simplify them in this way to make them like into the sort of strict kernel regime, then you get to see this like weird stepwise loss, which is exactly what we'd predict from the theory of having this like kernel PCA type approach to this thing. And so in the paper, it goes through the math of the linear versions of this, and then the nonlinear versions, we would expect to generalize 
from that linear one to the nonlinear one because of the neural tangent kernel and how like the neural tangent kernels are very similar to the deep learning ones. And so we kind of see like, oh, okay, look, like it looks like most of what's happening in these systems is it learning these like features. And when we look at what those features are, like the, you know, the primary like direction or whatever in this like kind of data kernel space, they end up being really stupid things like color or, you know, brightness or contrast or things like this when we were doing our own embeddings on a kind of simplified version of these things. And so it's, it's almost like a way, a sort of hand wavy way to think about this is like what it learns first is like, okay, I'm trying to separate images. I just need to tell them apart. I'm first just going to check by color. And like, if it's, you know, red or whatever, I guess it's that color. If it's blue, it's this other color or it's this other, this other image. Okay, great. Well, now I've got a little more capacity. So now I guess I can do not just color, but I can also do contrast, not just color and contrast, but brightness. Not, oh, okay. I kind of ran out of like, you know, overall global things to do. Now I'll start looking at stuff in this region of the thing, or now I'll start looking at these types of patterns or whatever. And so it's kind of like pulling out like pieces of the data to pay attention to and to use to separate things. And these kind of things are the, the features. They're not the features that we would use for an image, right? We would use things like what is in the image, like the sort of semantics of it, but it doesn't really matter. You can still use these like weird features to kind of get it, do a pretty good job at the types of tasks that we're trying to do. The self-supervised image thing, right? The task is to tell apart two different images and to tell if two transforms of the same image are the same. So if you take one image and you make it black and white, you want to say like this image is the same as you know these two images, the black and white version, the color version, they're the same image. And this other image, you know, the, the color version and this other image are not the same as each other. So that's what's happening in self-supervised image learning. So here, all it's saying is like the types of features that it's learning are these kind of like, I don't know, I think they're kind of dumb. Uh, they do evolve in the deep learning ones and they do probably end up making better ones over time, but it was interesting to see like how this actually happens. Another work of Jamie's, which was not really presented here, but is very connected to this is kernel learning has this like kind of capacity. Actually, Jamie found these kind of like conserved quantities like you would have in physics, like velocity or, or momentum or mass, where it's like, this is just how much learning you have, like learnability. You have X amount of learnability and you can spend it on these different directions in different ways, but you can only spend so much of it. You can kind of balance between learning these different eigen directions, but you want to like spend it kind of maximally on like the most important one and then a little bit less on the next one, a little bit less on the next one. And that's, that's what we see here as well. Like the first one kind of gives you the biggest impact and then the next one, the next one is kind of like lower and lower impacts. So those, those two works are connected as well. I think probably most people will be like me and yeah, feeling like we need to study this a little bit further still to really... Yeah, I think you'll have to uh, dig into the, the blog posts and papers and feel free to, uh, to read that. We're happy to chat about it more for sure. It is a little bit complicated and it's not necessarily the normal kind of like approach that people take to deep learning for sure. Very, very interesting though. Anything I can do to, to get a better sense for, you know, as you said, like the very practical, like what are these things learning and how I'm, you know, always kind of willing to uh, roll up my sleeves on that. We only have so much time and that, that definitely is one that I, I want to kind of continue to come back to and, and ponder more. But just to kind of round out a little bit more of what you guys are doing, you're also engaging in policy. And I understand you were at the AI Safety Summit recently in the UK and have kind of been doing some prototype type work to show governments how they might start to, to use, um, you know, the latest AIs in obviously all the, you know, the information processing that goes on in the bureaucracy. Give us a rundown, too, of, of what you're doing on the engagement, uh, safety and policy side. A lot of people are very uh, interested in AI. A lot of people are concerned about AI. A lot of people worry about its, you know, potential effects now and in a slightly further future as well. And I think it's a thing that we think about as well, especially, you know, building these systems. We want to make sure that these things are actually having a positive impact on the world. Right. So our approach is a very kind of practical engineering one to safety and to policy and to regulation. And I think, you know, we've been very excited to see the stuff that, you know, people were putting out at the, the safety summit in the UK, the executive order. I think a lot of people are thinking very reasonable thoughts about like, you know, how do we measure these systems? What kind of impact are they going to have? And it's, it's, it's nice to see governments kind of taking this stuff seriously and thinking about it. What we want to do is we want to be helpful, you know? So one of the things that we did actually was we looked at the request for comments uh, on AI by the Department of Commerce, by the NTIA. And we looked at all those submissions and these submissions could come from anyone. They came from organizations, they came from nonprofits, they came from agencies, and they came from a bunch of people. So there were thousands of comments by individuals. And we, you know, wanted to ask like, okay, can we actually use AI to understand these comments? Like, can we make a sort of positive use case example? Like, yes, there's lots of things to be worried about. You can see our, you know, previous work on like the kind of 
failures on models that like ethics uh, scenarios and like, oh, okay, you can kind of break them in these different ways. But here we wanted to show up sort of the opposite version. Like if you're really careful about this, you can do a good job of using them properly. So what we did is we kind of broke down the problem and we actually used language models to ask questions about every single one of those in a way that, you know, would have been really annoying for a person to have to go read every single one of them. And then we also asked people on a smaller subset and then correlated the responses on the smaller subset with the language model to check, like, is the language model, you know, getting these wrong very frequently? Is it being like biased in some weird way, et cetera? And so we really dug into the details and we found that if you're careful about the questions that you ask and you ask your questions in the right way and you kind of check, like, does this make sense? Am I asking the right kind of question or do people correlate with this? You can have some pretty cool tools for analyzing like much larger sets of data. So I think that that's kind of what we did in this particular one. Some of the things that we found, you know, there were a lot of people, obviously, that were pessimistic about this. OK, you know, there were actually a lot more artists that talked about this. Copyright infringement was a big thing. Personal economic impacts was another big thing. You know, people were worried about AI not having the right values or privacy or misinformation. There were definitely, you know, some interest in people for regulating this. We can only say so much in terms of like what are the conclusions from these comments because they're very self-selected, right? This doesn't represent the entire population. But it was cool at least to be able to analyze and say, hey, at least for the people who responded, what were they trying to say? You know, it seems like at least somebody has kind of heard that message. You know, we've got the Biden administration telling departments that they need to kind of start to figure out what, you know, how they're going to incorporate AI into their work. And honestly, I thought that was pretty cool to see. And I am a big believer that like, getting hands on with the technology is for almost every, you know, practical purpose, a good step for, uh, for almost anyone to take. So that was cool. What were your takeaways from the AI safety summit and your participation there? So I wasn't there actually, my co-founder Ken June was there uh, and she did have a whole bunch. She actually has a whole tweet thread on, on some of her takeaways, um, but I won't uh, summarize them here because they're, they're not necessarily my thoughts, but I would encourage people who are interested to go, to go check those out. Um, I think my takeaways from, that and the executive order were just that you know a lot of this was a lot more like reasonable and measured and et cetera than i would necessarily have expected there's a lot of like calls for figuring out how to measure things a lot of calls for investigation and things like this a lot of focusing i think rightly on mitigations and on kind of very specific problems like looking at you know cybersecurity or biological harm or something like this like yeah, we should just do a good job on those things anyway. And actually, there are already agencies that try and do that. So we should just have them spend some time thinking about how do we make this stuff better anyway? Is there anything we want to change given these new models? That seems like kind of the right way to approach it instead of trying to make this like big blanket, you know, new agency or radically change everything. Like there's a lot of smart people thinking really hard about this stuff already. We just kind of need to do the detailed work of like actually making things better, not like overhaul everything. Yeah, it seems like it would definitely be a little premature for that. But at the same time, you know, the, this does feel like it introduces a, a sort of tail risk that is probably not in anybody's established jurisdiction. I don't know if you would agree with that, but... That's kind of what the UK AI Safety Summit was focusing on, was more of these like longer term risks. And there does seem to be actually pretty significant international cooperation on that because nobody wants to go extinct. So even China is like, yeah, this seems great. Like, let's make sure everything is, you know, nice and safe from these like other long tail risk things. I think there's a lot of willingness to collaborate on those type of things, which was very encouraging to see. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the fact that there's any, you know, agreement or same page uh, sort of stuff with China at this point is, uh, you know, ray of hope as, as far as I'm concerned. So just a co couple minutes left. I mean, what a wide ranging uh, portfolio you guys have from, you know, having created these environments to experiment with reinforcement learning in to moving to coding agents to developing frameworks to break things down to, you know, this optimization package to the kind of fundamental more in interpretability style research, uh, and even the policy engagement, um, you know, all going at once. If I counted correctly on the website, there were only 26 faces. So that's a lot to be going on at a uh, small company. Obviously, a lot more resources coming in now. I assume you know, a significant part of that will be to growing the team. So how do you kind of tie all this together? What's kind of the, you know, the pitch to new people? Is it that they can you know, kind of add a seventh thing to the portfolio because you guys are just so open to that kind of thing? Or, or do you kind of tie it into some single vision that you guys will be going toward? And, and what kinds of people are you looking for? 
looking at it from the outside, it may seem like it's a little bit more scattered and there's all these different things going on, but actually everything really does tie together. The way we set goals as a company is for, for the quarters, we just sit down and we type in a big Google doc together and we just write out like, you know, what do we want to do this quarter? What did we do last quarter? What went well? What didn't well? Like, what are we worried about? What are we excited about? And then we sort of like synthesize this stuff together and figure out like, okay, these are like the main small number of things that we're actually going to do. So we do a relatively small number of things and they are pretty directed. Like if we look at, you know, carbs, for example, carbs is a kind of piece of infrastructure that just accelerates us massively across all the types of experiments that we run. And so this has been super worth, like this is more than paid for itself uh, since we made it a long, long time ago. Similarly for the NTIA analysis, like us doing that analysis was us prototyping our own models and our own internal agents for question answering type tasks. And the reason we're doing that is this quarter, our goal is to make tools that we ourselves seriously use. So this is one example of those tools. We also have tools for fixing errors, for writing unit tests, for writing other functions, for you know, writing recruiting emails and scheduling. So there's all sorts of different things that we're doing. We're not doing an infinite number of things. We're doing four or five kind of carefully chosen applications and then making sure those work. And how does that feed back into the model? How does that feed back into the infrastructure and the data that we need, et cetera? So it is all kind of like working together. Yes, we do have a relatively small number of people. We have 27 now as of, uh, I think Tuesday, we had a recruiter join us. So uh, we're slightly larger. We have a small number of people, but they're all like very, very competent. Like the reason we're able to do so many of these things is just we have a very, very like independent, autonomous kind of talented team. And we want to keep that and we are going to grow that. We are going to probably grow, you know, maybe double a year over year. We very specifically are not going to grow as fast as necessarily OpenAI has or Anthropic has or other companies have over the past year or two. And the reason for that is that we want to make sure that from a cultural perspective, we preserve the things that we're really excited about. We would much rather have a company that is, you know, 200, 300, 400 people where everyone is super highly leveraged and independent and amazing and doing like and working at some huge like kind of magnification factor then have a super super huge team and i think the thing that hopefully is going to enable that is like as we actually make these ai agents work then great like we can act at a much higher level like instead of having you know, a giant team of recruiting coordinators we'll probably just have one who's using a whole bunch of these different agents right i think that's what we want kind of for everyone and that's already what we're starting to see we'll probably end up spending more on compute than we will on people from our most recent fundraise. And I expect that actually to just grow over the future or we'll actually end up having like, you know, very highly leveraged individuals. So I think that's kind of how we think about it is can we actually make the tools to make this happen so that we can stay small and tighten it? And there's a lot of benefits that we get in terms of communication and culture, et cetera, from that. We just need to make these tools actually work so that we don't need to hire 10,000 people. Thank you for this rundown of all your recent projects. It is a fascinating collection and uh, I will certainly be digging in a little bit more on uh, some of the research and eagerly awaiting what it is that you guys put out next. For now, Josh Albrecht, CTO of Imbue, thank you for being part of the Cognitive Revolution. Thank you very much. It is both energizing and enlightening to hear why people listen and learn what they value about the show. So please, don't hesitate to reach out via email at tcr at turpentine.co, or you can DM me on the social media platform of your choice. Omniki uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in OmniKey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount. 